evening all and welcome to the last uh, session in this uh, complications in upper limb surgery series being brought to you by the EO North America Hand Education Committee. Uh, today's session is going to be uh, spearheaded by Kevin Malone from Cleveland but before we dive into that session uh, I thought it would be important to share with you um, my report as this is also the last webinar during my tenure as the chairman of the AO North America Hand Education Committee. And, you know, I started on July 1st of 2019. And for the first eight months, things were just hunky-dory. Uh, it was routine. We had in-personal educational events and standalone webinars. And life was good. And then uh, on March 16th, everything changed. The beauty about having been part of this committee has been that we quickly realized when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And we saw an opportunity. And as a collective group, we had the vision to create and curate content which is of the highest caliber for online education for residents and surgeons, which established us as the undisputed leader in online hand surgery education. Now, how did we go about it? As a group, we have always believed in opportunity, diversity, and inclusion. And we felt that if, as a hand surgeon, you do not have hand therapists on your committee, it's uh, somewhat incomplete because without a good hand therapist, no hand surgeon has good outcomes. So we added uh, Becky Nidaske, uh, who has been spectacular, and unfortunately, she's leaving us for greener pastures. We also felt that if you're going to be educating the next generation, it's important to hear what the next generation wants. So we added a resident PGY-5 as a, a committee member, and Kiran was the first uh, uh, resident member. As the year went by and we realized our audience's needs and desires, we felt that as a the hand education committee, we were in silos and we are not interacting with other groups. And so much of the work we do is uh, trauma related. So with bearing in mind that we always wanted opportunity, diversity and inclusion, we felt that interacting with trauma would be the ideal way to do it. And Christina Bolton fit the bill perfectly. In addition, we also had a second resident representative with Monica. Most of the work we do also caters to community hand surgeons, but we don't hear from them. So having them as a representative would be critical. And Jonathan Sheeran came on board. And finally, the first thing we learned from the first year uh, was that we had a large international audience thanks to YouTube and our content being freely available. So we added a partner nation and the concept of a partner nation was, bo was born out of a discussion that I had with Steve Schwartz, who suggested that uh, as opposed to guest nation, it should be partner nation. So Steve, thank you. Anil Bhatt from Manipal was a, has been a first member and he's doing a great job. We decided to recruit new faculty and we felt it was important to recruit them from all different walks of life, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery and trauma. We have given a large uh, um, importance to recruiting more women uh, leaders and role models. And all the hand therapists bar one have been women. We also activated multiple new faculty who have been on the AO rosters, but who had not had an opportunity, and but was presented to us when we were in the throes of the pandemic. And finally, it, I just realized a couple of weeks ago when Christina was doing her session on the complications, that all the things that we worked towards had come to fruition because not only did Christina do a fabulous job, but as usual, but three out of four faculty were women and three out of four were traumatologists on a hand education committee webinar. So target achieved. Our international outreach has consisted of working closely with uh, Anil Bhatt and uh, the Kasturba Medical College in Manipal, India. We had an international roundtable with 10 nations represented in the hand therapy session. We had an international roundtable in the master class session represented by 13 nations. And finally, we have established a connection with Ortho TV, which is a web-based learning platform based out of India, who live stream all our programs on Facebook, YouTube, as well as Ortho TV. This has increased our target audience to a very large extent. And the beauty of all this is we are providing all this education at no cost to the audience. Over the last uh, two and a little bit years, these are the series we conducted for a total of 88 sessions in just over uh, two, and a, two years and two months and involving 300 to 325 faculty. The power of online learning can be seen from these numbers. 
most uh, of our in-person webinars, if you want to call it that, before the onset of the pandemic, had anywhere between 100 and 225 attendees. But because of our maintaining our uh, content online, you can see that uh, there's been an exponential increase in not only people who attend live, but people who are able to revisit again and again uh, the wonderful education that is provided by the Hand Education Committee. Finally, uh, a brainchild that was born out of Jay Bridgman's thought process, uh, we created two fellowships, four weeks each, which have only just been approved. These are fully funded fellowships from the Hand Education Committee to a young surgeon, hopefully within the first five years of the practice. And one of the stipulations we had was we want them to visit parts of the world which, um, which are important to all of us, but which sometimes we don't seem to see. So with that in mind, uh, we have created one fellowship spot for uh, India and one fellowship spot for the Hospital Italiano in Buenos Aires in Argentina. These will be getting started uh, next year in Marco's term. So what's the future? I'll be handing off to Marco Rizzo, who is the Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and the Chair of the uh, Hand Surgery Division at Mayo. We have wonderful courses coming up, um, which will be the, the first course will be the next one uh, next weekend, the last course of my tenure, which finishes on June 30th. And then the next one is in Tampa, which will be uh, spearheaded by Jay Bridgman and Jeff Lawton. We have a bunch of webinars also coming up, but none of this would have been complete or achievable without the hard work and the support of all these wonderful AO North America staff. Steve Schwartz, the CEO, Chitra Subramaniam, the uh, CLO, Jenny and D Doreen, our education managers, Abigail, Josh and Cherise, and all our uh, AV faculty, uh, AV staff, including Max. And finally, Ortho TV, who have take, allowed us to take our message to so many different parts of the world, which we otherwise perhaps may not have been able to. Last but not least, all the members of the AO North America Hand Education Committee who have been instrumental in making our work uh, so meaningful. And to all our faculty, I say a very heartfelt thank you. It is time to pass the baton to Marco Rizzo. And I must say that it's been a joy and honor and a privilege. So with that being said, thanks very much. Okay, so uh, my name is Kevin Malone. I'm uh, here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and I am going to moderate this session tonight on complications in upper limb surgery. Uh, and this particular session will be uh, addressing complications after elbow fracture fixation. Uh, again, uh, as Dr. Mudgal uh, just indicated, this is his last uh, online seminar as a uh, chairman who really oversaw tremendous development of our uh, presentation and offering to uh, surgeons around the world. And thank you again, Shai, for all you've done for all of us. Uh, so this is me, I, I'm a, a, a hand surgeon here in Cleveland, Ohio. And I am joined tonight on this uh, seminar by Dr. Jonah Davies and Dr. Doug Hanel from Harborview Medical Center in Seattle and Dr. Jonathan Barlow uh, from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and, and in terms of our inclusion, uh, Motive, uh, Dr. Hanel and I are both hand surgeons, but Dr. Davies and Dr. Barlow are both orthopedic trauma surgeons. Uh, and there's so much overlap in what we do, uh, particularly as it relates to the upper limb. Uh, these are our disclosures for all involved in uh, tonight's session. Uh, and we do not believe that there will be any uh, relevant conflicts of interest to the material presented tonight. Uh, here's our agenda. We're a little bit behind uh, a schedule by a few minutes from Dr. Mudgall's presentation, but we're gonna discuss tonight uh, management of persistent instability following terrible triad fracture dislocation by Dr. Davies. And then Dr. Hanel will talk about the management of post-traumatic elbow stiffness. Dr. Barlow will discuss the management of distal humerus malunions and non-unions. And then I'll finish up with a discussion of the unhappy ulnar nerve after elbow trauma. Uh, in terms of content validation, this is brought to you by the AO North America, which is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, as a group, we do not endorse nor promote the use of any specific product or service of commercial entities. And uh, we will not be using any specific equipment, but there will be implants you will see throughout uh, lectures and, and uh, slides uh, that are not necessarily endorsed by uh, the, the organization. 
uh, as we uh, presume that this is not the first session that most of you have been involved with, you are aware that all of your microphones have been muted, but we do want participation from you. So please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen to write your questions, which will be then answered either live uh, or in the same question and answer box by our course faculty tonight. Uh, and, and any really good talk or good questions we will discuss as a faculty, uh, either in between sessions or at the end of all of the sessions, depending on time available. Uh, please don't use the chat box on the bottom of your screen as this is intended for faculty and staff. So our objectives for tonight's session are that at the end of this presentation, you as participants will be able to identify common complications after upper limb surgery involving fracture, tendon and or nerve repair or reconstruction, uh, evaluate each complication clinically, understand and evaluate the investigative modalities for each complication, and be able to develop an algorithmic approach for treating each of these complications. So we've been through a series of them already. Tonight is series seven. This is the last in this session. Uh, and again, talking about elbow fracture fixation, but all of the other ones are available for your review on the uh, AO uh, YouTube page. Uh, again, uh, repeating what Dr. Mudgall introduced, uh, we do have an upcoming live uh, se academic session next week in uh, Tampa. Uh, and then another one in Tampa in a few months. Uh, and you can uh, at, register for these and upcom other upcoming sessions through the AO website. Uh, again, also repeating what Dr. Mudgall said, we do have several upcoming webinars. Uh, over the summer, we don't do these series sessions anymore, but on August 10th, Dr. Greenberg will be moderating a session on DRUJ instability. Uh, on October 5th, Dr. Ree will uh, up, uh, moderate a session on the management of bone defects in the upper limb. And then on December 7th, uh, Dr. Lawton will moderate a session on non-union and malunion in the hand and wrist. Uh, again, all of these uh, tonight's session and all of the other ones that we have uh, done previously are available on the AO North America channel on, uh, through YouTube, and you can access those at any time you like. Uh, and also we want to uh, mention the AO Trauma Hand North America series podcast. Uh, which you can get from uh, wherever you normally download your podcasts. So with that being said, uh, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and turn the session over to Dr. Davies uh, on the um, discussion of uh, post-operative instability following terrible triad. Thanks, Kevin. I'm Jonah Davies from Harvard Medical Center. <clears throat> Uh, so I will try to catch us up on time a little bit. Uh, my, my task is to talk about uh, post-op instability and terrible triads or post-treatment and residual instability and how to address that. Um, so, you know, the goals are to identify the reasons for residual instability and develop a systematic treatment algorithm. And basic principles for terrible triads, I, I'm not teaching anybody anything new, but they do have a predictable pattern of instability and we have sort of protocolized the treatment, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, dealing with the radial head fix or replace and then addressing the coronoid, uh, and then following that, uh, addressing the lateral uh, uh, lateral side ligaments. Um, and if there's still residual instability, then the MCL repair, and then followed by either internal or external joint stabilization. And that typically uh, uh, takes care of most of the uh, most of the cases. And so, what happens is when something goes wrong with some of this, with one of these steps, then you can have some post-operative uh, instability. Uh, typically what I see failures uh, uh, happen when we deviate from that protocol. So that means <clears throat> either an incomplete repair, uh, that could be that the LUCL wasn't repaired in the correct position or in the correct tension. Uh, it could be that the MCL needed to be repaired and it wasn't. It could be that the coronoid was not repaired or repaired uh, inadequately. And it could be that the common extensor origin tension repair wasn't uh, adequate as well. And so all those things can lead to a residual instability. Uh, same thing if the, you know, the repair is inaccurate. And that could mean <clears throat> not positioning the ligaments in the correct position on the humerus or on the ulna, but also uh, radial head, either the, re the repair isn't adequate, the open reduction to fixation um, is non-anatomic or the uh, replacement is either overstuffed or understuffed. And then finally, the, what I typically see is uh, an attempt is made at a repair when really what was needed was a reconstruction. So um, those are all sort of uh, surgical errors that we can make. And then finally, there's always non-compliant patient or um, less than compliant patient. 
which can be an issue as well. The last thing I'll say is that uh, we have to differentiate the subtle instability that we sometimes see in the OR when a patient is paralyzed, um, which you can see here in the top two images, the, um, the, the slight uh, posterolateral rotary instability, which corrects when the patient is contracting um, uh, their muscles, as opposed to something more like the drop sign that you see on the bottom image, which typically is a harbinger of uh, post-operative instability and dis redislocation. So to take us through these different uh, ideas, I thought we could look at some cases. Uh, so the first case is gonna be a 55 year old. He's a mechanic. He slipped at work, had pain in his left elbow. You can see here his, uh, um, his elbow. This was treated uh, with reduction and then placed in a splint. And uh, for some reason, this patient, a, dis a decision was made to treat him non-operatively, uh, which can be an option for some patients in terrible triad, uh, but typically most younger, active, healthy patients uh, would need surgical management. <clears throat> so the plan for this patient was to return to clinic in two weeks and then uh, re-x-ray his, uh, his elbow and uh, progress his uh, therapy from there. Unfortunately, oh sorry, here's his post-reduction images. So you can see some fairly good reductions. Um, unfortunately, the patient missed his follow-up, removed his splint, and uh, failed to return uh, until five weeks later and had sort of early heterotopic ossification. Um, and so, you know, now the question for me is, is now what? And, and when I look at this, the first thing I think of is, okay, the radial head looks like it's, it's been impacted. The pieces are, you know, been grinded down. The uh, electronon <clears throat> or the coronoid fragment is no longer sort of visible to be seen. And there's starting to be uh, heterotopic ossification or at least Im imbricated tissue into the joint. And uh, when, I, um, when I think about this, how to treat this, to me, this is a chronic elbow dislocation. And you know, it's above the four week mark. It's, you know, there's been multiple attempts at uh, either you know, multiple dislocation or multiple attempts at, redu uh, at reduction. And so when I think about this, to me, it needs a reconstruction. So, um, the steps that I typically do for these are, are treat them as a chronic dislocation, which means go in, open the elbow, um, basically perform a full release of the elbow to be able to, to get it reduced concentrically, um, and then uh, perform a ligament reconstruction. And so typically, I'll start on the lateral side. Um, I'll address the radial head uh, because I do think that the radial head um, uh, is much more difficult to fix in these chronic ones if it's even possible. And so I think having a nice stable radial head provides extra, extra stability. And so my, um, my um, a threshold to replace the radial head is, is uh, much lower. Um, and then we'll repair, or sorry, reconstruct the lateral side followed by reconstructing the medial side if needed. And then again, adding on a, uh, form of stabilization if we are still unable to keep the elbow uh, stable at that point. So here's what that looks like. Uh, you can see here there are larger um, uh, drill holes within the uh, uh, olecranon. Those are the drill holes for passing the, uh, the reconstruction. I typically use an allograft because it's available. However, autograft is definitely acceptable as long as you have good quality tendon. Um, I typically use a docking type technique, which I'll get to in the next slide. You can see the radial head was replaced here. This is a smooth stem replacement. This is what I use for all of my replacement, not necessarily this implant, but a similar implant. And uh, once the reconstruction is done, I range the elbow, test the elbow in various degrees of flexion and extension and pronation and supination. And if the elbow is stable, then I end the reconstruction there. If it is unstable, then I prepare to have either an internal or an external type of joint stabilization. And so here's what the docking technique looks like. You can see that the holes in the ulna, and you can see the isometric point in the uh, distal humerus on the lateral side. Here's sort of what it looks like when you're uh, done <clears throat> repairing. You can see the two strands. Sometimes the, when the strands are not providing enough stability, you can suture them together like in this case. And so this is a recap of what was done. Uh, in this case, the coronoid wasn't addressed because it was very small and there was no uh, fragment left to repair. The capsule had uh, sort of eroded at that, light, at that level. Um, and this, this patient had a very stable elbow. 
Uh, here he is at about a year out. You can see some residual uh, sag on the radio capitellar joint, but um, and some early arthritis. But the patient has very good motion. And so I think that this is a very good uh, outcome for this patient. So the take home points for me for the uh, for this is to you know be careful with the non-op management. Uh, these patients need close follow up. You want to typically uh, re uh, reconstruct patients when they come in over four weeks. And really, for these chronic patients, I think having a low threshold for um, for radiohead arthroplasty is. Uh, probably uh, um, more important in chronic cases than in early cases. And whatever I do, I try to rehab them early. So I make sure that they have a, a stable elbow so I can rehab them early enough. Uh, the second case, so this is another case. This is a patient of mine who uh, tripped and fell. She was seen at an outside hospital and found to have a, uh, a distal radius fracture. And... Uh, ultimately underwent operative fixation of that distal radius fracture, came back to clinic to remove her splint at the 10-day mark and was uh, complaining of uh, elbow pain when they obtained this x-ray. And, um, and so, at, you know, at this point, what they, they did is they tried to close reduce the patient and see her again uh, one week later. And, you know, if, if I could co copy and paste, it would be the exact same x-ray. So, at one week now, the patient has the, the exact same uh, uh, problem. At that point, she's brought into the operating room for a closed reduction and essentially an imbrication or, or repair, but it's not clear. And so now she presents to my uh, office uh, at about five weeks. She's had one closed surgery, one open surgery, um, or and another, I guess, another open surgery on her wrist, and, and it's still dislocated. And so at this point, I guess the question is, is what to do. And so when I look at this x-ray, I think, well, that looks a lot like the previous one we just saw, except you could see there's more uh, heterotopic ossification within the joint already. And uh, when I look at the AP, I see a lot of early bone loss on the capitellum, probably from the radial head rubbing up against it. And so um, in this case, I'm always ready to address that bone loss and the different ways to address the bone loss for me are um, either allograft or to have some form of distraction um, uh, interposition, which means using a, a joint stabilizer or an external fixator. And so what you can see here is once uh, we perform the heterotopic ossification and removal, and got the elbow reduced, uh, you can see there's missing about a third of her capitellum on the AP. And it's most of it is in the posterior half of the joint, which means whenever you get into extension, the, uh, the, uh, the radial head typically wants to dislocate posteriorly and laterally. And so again, here I've done the uh, passing of the ligaments for the reconstruction. You can see that the holes within the um, ulna. And at this point we prepare the internal joint stabilizer. So placing the pin, you can see the pin has to be parallel to the joint uh, in both planes and centered on the um, isometric point. Once the pin is drilled, then you place the plate uh, for, the, um, uh, for the rest of the stabilizer. At that point, I completed the ligament uh, reconstruction and uh, locked the stabilizer in. And the elbow was very stable through a whole range of motion. And this allowed the ligaments uh, to be able to, uh, to, to heal. Um, at this point, patient came back at three months and I removed the internal joint stabilizer and you can see that the ligament repair plus the imbrication of the capsule, which was done at the same time as the ligament repair uh, through this suture anchor, uh, allows her to be very stable all the way into full extension. Uh, she does have full flexion as well. And you can see her range of motion is quite good. And so uh, the take home points for this case are really that open reduction alone doesn't work. Um, when you have these chronic cases, you really have to release everything before you can reconstruct. And then once you're released enough, then you're able to get them reduced anatomically and concentrically. The bone loss uh, is, is very difficult to deal with. I think if you have an a large electronon fragment, that's uh, sorry, a coronoid fragment that's missing, could uh, you can use things like the electronon tip 
or the radial head to use as a graph. You can use the radial head as a graph for capitellum fragments missing. If you have the radio, the native radial head available, you can also use allograph for both of those. And again, you can use the distraction interposition uh, as, a, as an option for these patients. And so the big question is, when do we remove these internal joint stabilizers? And I don't know the right answer. I, I typically uh, will remove them anywhere from 12 weeks to uh, 16 weeks, but it, I have had patients leave and never come back. And uh, uh, so far they are doing well as well. So I think that that's, those are all uh, options, but the, you know, when you have these, these problems, just know, you know, realize that even if you do a really good reconstruction uh, for that case, the bone loss alone will cause it similar to a hill sacs uh, or a bank heart lesion in the shoulder will cause the, the elbow to dislocate. And so there is a question in the, uh, the Q&A and I can answer it right now. So the, um, I typically will prepare my entire uh, um, LCL reconstruction first. I will place the pin and reduce the elbow, rep uh, repair around the pin, and then finally set the, uh, the tension in the IJS at the end. All right. And so just to keep us on time, I'm gonna to get to the last case here. This is a case that I like showing because it is kind of a disaster and it just shows you that sometimes uh, you don't, you know, you can throw everything at, at a case and it's still uh, unclear what to do. So this is a 65 year old patient. Uh, she fell down the stairs. She's got morbid obesity, like BMI 60. Uh, her uh, contralateral elbow has a bad Montagia fracture. And on this side, you can see a very bad uh, a terrible triad fracture. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, following the algorithm, I, I looked it up and I found it and I was able to, 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 you know, sort of put into place the plan. I replaced the radial head. I repaired the, the lateral collateral ligament. Um, and then I stressed it in pronation. And you can see here, huge opening on the medial side. So then I, I repaired the medial side. And then you can see now that the, the joint is nice and congruent. I uh, then stress the elbow in multiple planes of flexion and extension all the way into full extension, as you can see on the bottom right corner, full pronation, full supination, absolutely no instability. Very happy with the result. Patient was placed into a splint. I typically splint them uh, for uh, seven to 10 to 14 days, depending on the instability. Uh, and the patient didn't come back uh, until four weeks. And here's her four week x-ray. And so she, um, you know, came back without her splint so that it fell off, <clears throat> that she felt the clunk coming out of bed. And so now she had this sort of pretty bad injury. And so I thought to myself, well, I know what to do with this. I just presented it in the last case. I'm just gonna reconstruct everything, place an internal joint stabilizer. And you can see here, I started doing that. Unfortunately, her bone was such, had such poor quality that I was unable to get the pin in the correct position. I even grafted around the pin to try to stabilize it. And uh, you know, I thought, well, at least it was stable in the operating room with motion that I would splint her up and, and be able to hold her like that for four to six weeks and have her stiff and stable and then be able to you know, re release her later on if needed. Uh, unfortunately, the patient came back at the two week mark and uh, had been using her arm to get out of bed and so had this very bad sort of injury where she fractured through the, uh, the, the distal portion of the humerus with her internal joint stabilizer. So the question now is, now what can we do? What are some different options? And when you look through the literature, you know, some option would be just take everything out. Another option would be a total elbow replacement. The problem with her uh, is I did not feel that her body habitus would tolerate, a, a, an, or the elbow would tolerate her body habitus. And, um, other options you know, described include a transarticular screw, which I think she would have broken uh, almost instantaneously. And so the final option, what I ended up choosing was uh, removing the internal joint stabilizer and placing a uh, temporary 4.5 millimeter broad plate, which I bent in two different planes to get it onto the patient's ulna and onto her humerus. I also re-reconstructed the ligament and actually used an endo button to get some cortical uh, stability on that uh, with a plan to remove the plate at about 12 weeks. 
unfortunately, the patient never uh, followed up uh, until about the five month period, uh, mark. Thankfully, she had not fractured around the end of the plate. And at that point, we took the plate out <clears throat> and uh, was able to just release some of the tissue around her joint very uh, uh, summarily. All of her ligament repairs stayed intact and her range of motion was from about 20 degrees of extension to 105 degrees of flexion. She was very, very happy. So I think the take home points of this case are patient compliance will uh, outdo any, any amount of good surgery. I think you have to adapt the surgery to the patient. In retrospect, I should have added more stability, probably adding a, a static external fixator uh, during the first case after the good uh, result. I think there are always bailout options like I talked about, transarticular screw, ultimately total elbow replacement. Uh, but I think one of the most important things is that stiff stable is much better than stiff and unstable. And so ultimately, I think uh, more stability during the first surgery would have been would have been better for her. So the take home points of this are, you know, residual instability after a terrible triad. I think most of the time are due to technical mistakes, either the um, ligament repair or other uh, uh, issues. I think uh, an incomplete repair when you needed to repair the coronoid or the um, medial collateral ligament when there's bone loss or uh, patient factors, right? It could be body habitus. Sometimes compliance is not necessarily poor patient compliance, but it's poor education. Uh, we don't explain enough or uh, the patient just simply can't because of polytrauma or other issues. I think once you identify the, the problem, it's just a question of addressing it systematically. So correct the technical issues as possible. Uh, reconstruct probably more often than not with uh, rather than repair when you have residual instability. I, I think don't be afraid to use bone graft and don't be afraid to add additional stability. Thank you. Jonah, thanks. That's a great presentation and outlines all of the, the appropriate principles uh, to evaluate and treat these very complex uh, scenarios. Just a couple of questions to, to follow up on some of the things that you uh, discussed, uh, where you mentioned both medial and lateral uh, repair or and or reconstruction, uh, and you went through your approach of how you stress it after doing your lateral repair and then determining if you need a uh, to do medial repair as well. So do you do that through a global posterior approach or do you do everything laterally? And then if you need to make a medial uh, approach, do you do that you know, as a separate approach? Yeah, I, I actually do two approaches. So I typically go everything lateral unless there's an open or something like that. I'm working through a, uh, an approach and I will fix everything laterally. And then my uh, uh, sort of post uh, repair stress technique is to range the elbow through a full range of motion. Um, and then at 90 degrees, 45 degrees, and I try to get to as close to zero as possible, most of the time able to do it. Um, and then I do full supination, neutral, and full pronation. And in supination, obviously testing the lateral repair, uh, and then in pronation, especially in, uh, with the lateral repair stable, then you will see an opening of the joint, which will demonstrate a medial side. And if I'm not sure, then I'll go to the AP and try to stress it in a similar fashion. And then just... You know, obviously that that bridge plate is a sort of uh, the kitchen sink approach, but you know the other things that you had mentioned, you know, just what are your thoughts versus the internal joint stabilizer versus the use of a static or dynamic external fixator frame for these type of patients? Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of the, the uh, a lot of us have gone to using the internal joint stabilizer. It does provide a lot of benefits, but it also provides a lot of negatives if it's not done correctly, or if in like this patient, the bone quality does allow allow it to, to be stable. So I think it's a really good option, um, but if it doesn't work, I, a, a standard static external fixator is a really good uh, way to do things. I will typically put two pins in the humerus, two in the ulna, and then leave the patients in there for four weeks, have them come out of it at four weeks, and then start uh, with my, you know, with the standard sort of uh, supine uh, protocol for rehab. The transarticular screw, I'm not as uh, as much in favor, and although I do, I have done it once, um, it's more of in a fracture dislocation. So something like a Montagia or something like that, where there's a lot of fractures already going on and you may not be able to put an external fixer properly. Let's say there's a associated humerus fracture. Um, you know, you just wanna make sure you use a, a, a larger screw. So I use a four, you know, four or five screw, or we actually use a list Frank screw, which they don't make anymore, but uh, we have still in our hospital. Um, and um, 
saying, yeah, those are the different options. Really. But I think an, a static external fixator is probably the, a good go-to for most uh, for most of these cases. Great. Well, thanks again. That was a great talk. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to Dr. Hanel, also from uh, Harborview University of Washington, about uh, post-traumatic elbow stiffness. So, Dr. Hanel, all yours. Is my screen showing? It is. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. It's, it is an honor to be part of this faculty. I'm just going to talk about stiff elbows. I mean, and yes, they are a big deal. So, let's see if I can, there we go. You know, the function of the shoulder is to place the hand on the surface of the sphere. The function of the elbow is to position the hand within the volume of the sphere. Now, if we fuse a shoulder, we decrease the volume of a sphere. But if we fuse an elbow, we just destroy the feet, that fear in that place that you place your hand, whether or not it's 90 degrees or 120 degrees. So this is a big deal, and it commonly complicates elbow trauma. As we've seen from the previous lecture, the, uh, the approach to this is, is such that you need to do it right the first time. There's a simple classification that is extrinsic simple, meaning that there's heterotopic bone, but it doesn't involve the articular surface per se. And you can have ones that are complex, and that's where the in articular incongruity occurs, and there's bridging bone at that place. There's three ways to, to deal with this, or there's three parts of this treatment that uh, we deal with. The first is early in, in prevention. The second is intermediate with therapy, and then late is the operative things that we have to do in order to to bring those in place. I think one of the things that we learned from the previous lecture is it's best to do it right the first time. And if you have to choose stiffness over stability, a, a stiff, stable elbow allows you to then work on mobilization. And to that end, you know, if you have done a very good job of putting your articular surfaces together and you're really concerned about its stability, then I would let it get stiff. As, uh, as we saw, and then address that per se. You know, the role of therapy it, in our literature, it gets kind of bad mouth because you have articles like this that, that demonstrate that surgical release is much, much better than therapy. Well, of course it is, if this is what you just gave the therapist. There's no amount of static progressive splinting that's going to change that, which leads us to the topic at hand. My indications for operative intervention are the following. Less than 100 degrees of flexion extension, less than 120 degrees of pronation supination, and a patient perceives that this is a problem, and the patient is going to participate in therapy, and the patient has time to participate in therapy. The timing of surgery for this in the setting of heterotopic ossification is, uh, is I like to wait until the bone is stable, where the fractures have healed. And if you read the literature of over the last 20 years, the average time is somewhere between five and eight months after injury. Preoperative planning, I think it's paramount that you know where you've been and where you're going to go. And so that preoperative evaluation consists of read old op notes, document your range of motion, document your motors, document your sensibility, especially the ulnar nerve, because the ulnar nerve is really at risk of, of injury and or of release as you uh, go through this particular procedure. I use just plain imaging in most cases, but I will use CT scans or advanced imaging in those cases of uh, synostoses between the proximal or the distal and or the distal radial ulnar joint. I have a game plan and I have a backup plan. I think of all the worst things that could possibly happen. And to that end, my preoperative planning is my fracture line. Do I have to do fracture reduction? Do I have to do the things that we just saw in the previous lecture? Is a fracture united? And, if, and the reason that I like to know that is, can I take out the implants as I'm taking out the heterotopic bone? And if I've got implants, are they titanium? Because if they are titanium, then I add another hour 
because it's going to take me that long to get those titanium implants out compared to stainless steel. And then I want to know where else their heterotopic ossification could be or should be, and what I'm going to do about that. And I follow uh, the diagram that was provided by Hill Hastings and Tom Grant. And in that, the, uh, they have anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral heterotopic ossification. The other big what else is you really do have to know your anatomy. And I think that as, as complex as the anatomy is the hand, even more complex is the anatomy about the elbow. So the anatomy on your left is me dissecting an elbow. The anatomy on your right happens to be the landscape of Mars. And if you don't know your anatomy, you might as well be operating on the landscape of Mars to do that. So I try to learn from every case, and these are the cases that we're going to discuss. The first is a post-traumatic ulnar, radio ulnar synostosis. This is a 44-year-old woman who's uh, six and a half months after a montasia fracture, and she presents with th this synostosis. And uh, there's her flexion extension, about 100 degrees, but her pronation supination is zero. She's fixed at neutral. There's two camps in dealing with this. The first camp is Resect, Radiate, and Dean Soterianos presented this in 2004 in a, a cohort of about 30 patients, and you know, he, he had great results. And this is just an example of me following his advice on this particular case. The second camp is Resect, Don't Radiate, and Interpose Something. And there's various things that can be interposed. I happen to use fasciolata allografts. So my approach to these cases is I use the incision that was given me and the great majority of them. In this case, I'm going to convert this to an exposure that's called a Boyd Anderson. And it goes along the dorsal radial aspect of the ulna to the radius. And if you look at this cadaver dissection, you can sweep it all the way up. And in doing that, you can identify the entire area of potential synostosis between the brachial radii, or excuse me, the biceps tuberosity and um, the ulna as shown here. Now, while I'm doing that, I will try to define the proximal and distal ends of the heterotopic ossification. And this is her case, cadaver dissection on the left, on the right is her case. And then I have to figure out how I'm going to re divide that. And for the most part, I start out by confirming that I've got a proximal and distal lens of the, of the synostosis based on my knowledge from the CT scan and from image intensification during the operative procedure. And then I will cut along the, the surface of the ulna, which I've done here um, at either side of the elbow. Avoid burrs in these cases. I don't think they have a role in the management of heterotopic ossification. And so I divided that, that's pretty cool, She's got all her motion back. That's the good news. The bad news is I came to realize that that heterotopic bone that I had just caught off in the ulna was the biceps tendon. Now there happens to be a bony attachment to that biceps tendon. So my treatment consisted of taking that bone and that tendon, putting it in place, holding it in place. And then in these cases, this is my indication for using some sort of interposition technique. I've got a medullary canal that is open right where I stuck the bone in place. And I've got a resection adjacent to the proximal or adjacent to or proximal to the biceps tuberosity. And in those cases, I will put something in. And that's something that I put in is a fasciolata allograft. And this is just wrapped around the ulna and is held in place with suture anchors. Post-operative management is irrigation, close over drains, put a long arm splint, in maximum supination. Um, I will have these people stay overnight. And then uh, the following day, they start range of motion and a resting splint that matches the long arm splint shown here. And this is her results. Um, I, the x-ray on the left is probably six to eight months afterwards and uh, similarly so on the right. What about flexion and extension stiffness? And in these cases, you know, it becomes a question of how do I get there from here? Because this is a, 
a joint that is, has been put together by my, my partners. I know that it's going to be a perfect articular reduction, but I have to do a lot of bone resection. So the choices, again, go back to where is the heterotopic ossification? Is it anterior, posterior, which they usually are? And is it, do I have to address the medial side or the lateral side? So in choosing those, I, I usually use the old incision that I had for the most part, and hopefully it's a posterior incision because a posterior incision allows me to get to both sides of the joint. If it's not, and I've got a lateral incision, I can use that lateral incision to address flexion extension deficits, as well as address the, the pronation supination deficit that occurs most commonly, as in the case pre that I presented before. And then I will use medially, in those cases where I've got flexion extension deficits, especially if I've got an ulnar neuropathy. And this is, you know, one of the, the very popular articles in the hand literature uh, among my handed colleagues um, advocating lateral release. I think the one thing that you have to remember, if you're going to do a lateral release, I would do a simple release of the ulnar nerve through a separate incision. Um, and I think that you'll decrease the incidence of uh, ulnar neuritis as a result of your reconstruction procedure. One of the things that I th think is very important if you're doing burn reconstruction is to make your incision in the midlateral line of the elbow joint. And so the white dot is on the subcutaneous surface of the ulna, the red dot is on the medial epicondyle, the blue dot is on the is directly over the humerus and palpating it over the humerus. And in this case, we resected, uh, we had to resect the bone that was encasing the ulnar nerve. Whenever you see that group of heterotopic bone and where the arrows are, you have to know that your ulnar nerve is trapped there. And so I, uh, having done that, we resected that in this particular patient, including um, an anterior posterior release. But if you use the mid-axial line, uh, and, and kept it on there, then you can close your wound and you can go through a complete range of motion without having your wound dehiss. And this is the only way that I've done that. If you don't do this, then you're gonna have to do some sort of flap or, or supplemental skin graft coverage. So now we have this 28 year old motorcycle versus guardrail. He's got 120 degrees of pronation supination, pretty good. His ulnar nerve has 10 millimeter two point uh, deficiency. And as you flex him in, as you flex it, it becomes worse. And so in this case, I will follow the advice of Bob Hodgkiss. And he and I were writing about this at about the same time in various chapters. And I like his chapter better than mine. So if you're looking for a good description I think that, the, that his text is wonderful. In the same token, a very old text by Henry is a great way to learn your elbow anatomy, and especially from a surgeon's point of view. One of the things that is most importantly is, after you, is where do you go first? Well, I go first with a neurolysis of both the median and the ulnar nerve. And then I, I tend to go posterior. And I uh, go and elevate the triceps and do a triceps tenolysis and then remove the heterotopic ossification and the, and the posterior joint at the same time. Every time that I do this, I will also make sure that, that in the previous exposure, I have uh, mobilized and done a neurolysis of the median nerve. And then I go anteriorly over the top again, as I stated, mobilizing and neuralizing the median nerve, and then dissecting beneath the distal humerus. And I elevate the flexor pronator mass as if I were going to do a Learmouse submuscular transposition, because I am. Um, he, he, Bob Hodgkiss, uh, proposes using a uh, fascial sling. I have had real problems with that because of the distal kinking, and I just don't get it go well. So I have done, I, and I propose and advocate a Learmouth anterior submuscular transposition in almost all of these cases. And 
As a result of doing that, this is the hardware removal, heterotopic bone removal, and this is his range of motion. My post-operative care, I think, is controversial. I used to do this, and but I haven't in the last 10 years, and mostly because I, I, it's like this case that was presented. And th this patient has limited flexion extension, limited pronation, supination. There's heterotopic ossification. And in doing this, I followed exactly what Dr. Davies said. I took it apart, replaced the radial head, rebuilt and excised the heterotopic ossification, and then used a joint stabilizer uh, to augment my reconstruction of the joint. And this is his range of motion. And the question is, how long do you use an IJS? I haven't seen this guy after getting this range of motion exercises. So some of the more controversial things that we didn't discuss were, do you use radiation versus medications? And if you look at any of the meta-analyses from 219 onward, there's no real compelling reason to use radiation. And there might be benefit to using anti-inflammatories. There is one article that deals with Botox. Um, this is Mel Rosenwasser's group in New York. And they had a group of patients that they did release alone and got good results, release and radiation that got better results, and then release and Botox injection on the biceps and brachialis muscles. And... Uh, and so, you know, who's got the better looking elbow, I guess, is the question that goes with that. I don't think there is a role for prolonged CPM. I still use CPM on patients when they are in hospital. And I, but I won't use it uh, when they go home. I think that the first six weeks after the surgery, everything should be spent on motion, 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 motion. I don't care about strength. Um, and I won't start strengthening exercises until we're at six weeks out. So there's that result. So what are your expectations? They remain the same in, in all of the studies that that's, were presented in 2003 to, to most recently, is you can expect about a 45 degree gain in your flexion extension arc um, with these procedures. And you can expect an 80 degree gain and pronation, supination. And I think the point that, that really is, is we are really looking for 100 degrees of flexion at the elbow um, and you know, 120 degrees of pronation, supination as we present it. So the elbow may be the most important joint in the upper extremity with the exception of the thumb, but it is certainly uh, one of the most difficult to reconstruct. And so do anything you can to preserve and restore motion. And the uh, alternative to restoration of motion is not, not very rewarding. Thank you. Dr. Handel, that's a great talk and uh, refresh so many of the things that I learned from you back in fellowship. A um, couple of questions for you. I uh, didn't see anything from the audience. So I'll ask ones that I, that I still have about this issue, uh, you know, back, as a fellow, you were sending patients home on indomethacin for six weeks. Uh, are you still doing that? Uh, or are you switching over to other anti-inflammatory medications? And then do you think alternatively about IV steroids and Depomedrol postoperatively as an option for this type of problem? So the answer is no, no, and no. Okay. So I, as, as you know, I, I work for and with a woman named Julie Eagle, who runs our research program here. And Julie Eagle asked me to take a look at all of my patients that I had given indomethacin to in the papers that we wrote about them. And so I called all those patients up and I said, did you take your medicine that I gave you? And well over 90% of them said, absolutely not. It just killed me. So they stopped taking indomethacin. Uh, and if you look at the the literature, and I, I just recently did just before this afternoon, you know, there is no really well-controlled studies and that, that people think that Celebrex may be helpful. And 
the conclusions in the, of those studies are it may be helpful. Does any harm come to them? No. I have not been, and I haven't been using steroids because one of the reasons for me is that this is such a big cut, and a, such a big surgery um, that uh, that I have, I have, I think that the that compromises wound healing. So I, I haven't used it systemic or local. Perfect. All right. I, I didn't see any other questions. Any of the faculty members have questions for Dr. Handel on the management of the post-traumatic elbow stiffness? Doug, that was really good. One of the questions that I had, uh, something that I've read about a little bit, um, do you have indications for the early post-operative stiff elbow? For instance, you do a distal humerus fracture and they come in and uh, demonstrate um, really early uh, stiffness and particularly around manipulation under anesthesia. Or otherwise, I've read some emerging data that indicates that, that that may be safe to do if they're really stiff early on. Any thoughts about that or use of that in your practice? Um, I guess it becomes a matter of, of define early on. I can tell you who you don't do it on. Don't do it on somebody who has a head injury and don't do it in as their passive range of motion on a reconstructed elbow in the setting of a head injury is just a disaster. Um, if I have somebody that I think is really, really working hard, doesn't have any signs of reflex sympathetic dysphagia or complex regional pain syndrome, um, I will take them to the OR. But the most important thing in that setting is what's happening to the ulnar nerve. Because I've had kids, and this is that, that 16 to 26 year old patient who really, really works hard, but man, they just, you'll take them to the OR, you'll manipulate them. It's an easy manipulation. You bring them back and they won't move at all. And I, and I think it's actually Hill Hastings that told me that, you know, next time that happens to you, look and see what happens to the ulnar nerve and consider releasing the ulnar nerve at the same time. And so I do that. And then one more question, Doug, is, uh, you know, your thoughts in the early stages uh, after, before you progress to a contracture release on uh, therapy with static progressive splinting versus dynamic splinting. I don't think that dynamic splinting is a benefit. And, I, and, and, it's, and this is, again, a real bias on my part, but it seems to me that, that dynamic splinting is, is kind of like, it never gives up. It's just torture to the joint as, as, you, as you try to grow collagen. And so Paul Brand taught me that the best way to stretch out a joint is to get it to the point that it hurts just a little bit and then let the collagen grow as in static progressive splinting. So and then I know I always stuck with that. I've been much, much happier in my patients who have used static progressive splinting as opposed to dynamic. Perfect. All right, well, thanks Dr. Hanel for a great talk. And we'll now go to Dr. Barlow from the Mayo Clinic on the management of uh, non-unions and malunions uh, around the distal humerus. John? Great. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Can you see my screen and um, yep. hear me? Well? Good. Perfect. So that was just an outstanding talk, uh, Doug. And my talk is certainly a little less evidence-based and certainly less wisdom-based than that talk. But um, I would also put each of you, um, Doug, Kevin, and Jonah on notice because I may call on you for uh, some of these cases that I have coming up. So hopefully we can we can be a little bit interactive. My talk today, I'm a, um, a, a shoulder and elbow trauma surgeon and do quite a bit of elbow trauma as well. And I'm excited to talk about management of distal humerus fractures, particularly non-union and malunion. Uh, we discuss conflicts, none of which are really relevant here. The first uh, talking point that I would say is that distal humerus fractures are hard to fix. And many patients will require more than one surgery, particularly early in the post-operative period. So early discussion about the possibility of malunion, nonunion, and other complications is important. Many of these patients, we've already mentioned the ulnar nerve. Many of these patients will have nerve-mediated symptoms, and we'll talk about that in the next talk. And 
Oftentimes patients have some persistent functional issues. So our goal is to try and avoid that as much as possible. In the vast majority of cases, failed distal humerus open reduction internal fixation, in my opinion, is related to a few major causes. Inadequate reduction, uh, that can be an articular uh, reduction that's inadequate. Ina inadequate compression, as we know, the vast majority of these issues happen in the supracondylar region rather than intraarticular. Inadequate fixation, particularly unbalanced fixation with a lack of fixation distally. Inadequate implant strength, and I think we've seen um, better outcomes with slightly stronger and potentially even pre-contoured plates um, with modern fixation techniques. Infection certainly can be a cause. And then non-compliance or adherence, which Jonah mentioned earlier, can be another issue that we run into. For me, the workup really begins with a straightforward history and physical. I think you have to pay uh, careful attention. We've already mentioned the importance of soft tissues in these fractures. Pay careful attention to delayed wound healing, persistent drainage or antibiotics. The risk of open fracture in these settings is not insignificant, and many times patients actually forget that they had that. So I'll spend several iterations of discussion asking about the presence of infection. Did you have an infection after surgery? Did, the, um, did you have an open fracture? Did you have a compound fracture? Did you ever take antibiotics afterwards? Did you need an irrigation and debridement afterwards? And oftentimes patients will not immediately volunteer it, but then with time, will tell you that they did have an infection. I think careful inspection of the incisions is important. In many cases, we have to be thoughtful about what approach we take. Um, Jonah talked about doing sort of bilateral or medial and lateral uh, approaches versus an extensile posterior approach. In these cases, usually it's a posterior approach and a careful neurovascular exam, particularly focusing on the ulnar nerve and an understanding about the nerve status and nerve position, if it's a transposed nerve or if uh, the nerve has been left in situ. Testing for me is really x-rays, a CT scan. I almost always get a CT scan and typically I will use three-dimensional reconstructions to help me make decisions about that. And aspiration is a critical tool for me, particularly in the um, setting of a previous open fracture to rule out the possibility of infection. We keep those cultures for about 14 days to increase the yield of cutie bacterium acnes and other low grade or indolent organisms. And I have a low threshold to add an EMG both to preoperatively document what's going on with the ulnar nerve and, um, and the nerves about the elbow, but also in order to um, be able to follow that over time, heaven forbid, if you see a postoperative nerve palsy. For this, then it, it sort of goes down two roads and basically the options are revision, open reduction, internal fixation, or consideration of total elbow arthroplasty. And I think as we know, these distal humerus fractures are challenging to manage. And certainly after they've been fixed once, they become increasingly difficult to manage. So total elbow arthroplasty becomes an important tool. For me, one of the most important parts of this is a salvageable articular block. So obviously it needs to be important that we can save that articular cartilage and get a reduction that's acceptable for long-term motion and function. I'd like to see a correctable surgical problem. I never feel very confident about something where I think that I'm gonna be doing the same thing again and expecting a different outcome afterwards. In some cases, that's inadequate fixation. In other cases, we can see inadequate compression or reduction, and that can make us feel more confident about our ability to correct that and get a different result the second time. And finally, obviously, as a contraindication to total elbow arthroplasty, in some cases, particularly young patients, high demand post-traumatic patients, these are patients who may have rapid loosening of total elbow arthroplasty and potential early failure. Total elbow arthroplasty, on the other hand, is most commonly used for unsalvageable articular blocks. For me, many cases, and I'll lean toward total elbow arthroplasty if I think I need to do a large resection of infected bone in the distal humerus, um, particularly if I'm going to do a two-stage exchange. And then certainly the patient's expectations or desires for definitive surgical procedures uh, will weigh into my mind. So as we get a little bit older, the idea of long and progressive staged operations with potential for stiffness and other complications with salvage of, or revision, open reduction, internal fixation will um, lead me to consider surgical uh, management with total elbow arthroplasty. 
So those are kind of the concepts that I would build around this. And I've got a couple cases to illustrate this. So let's start with Jonah. Jonah, this is a case of a uh, gentleman that came and saw me. He's 44 years old. He's got an, a type one open um, elbow, elbow fracture. And you can see he's got this distal humerus fracture. As discussed in most cases, um, we'll get a CT scan with three-dimensional reconstructions. Jonah, what's your construct of choice for this patient with this fracture? We can see the low fracture line, particularly medial. Will you do an osteotomy and then, and then plate construct or does it matter uh, for this fracture? Um, plus minus on the osteotomy, just because the joint uh, looks like it's one block. Uh, so unless I'm struggling, then sure, I'm always ready to do an osteotomy. Um, I'm worried about the bone loss on the, uh, that you can see there, posterior, posterior laterally um, <clears throat> or anterior laterally, I guess. Um, typically I'm a 90-90 plater with probably additional fixation for this one uh, with many fragment plates to stabilize, stabilize, it, uh, stabilize the fragments out. Uh, probably like a mini fragment plate on the medial side, um, hold that, and then medial plate, posterior lateral plate, probably a lateral plate as well. And then I probably put something like cement or something to fill that bone graft or fill that bone defect. And then you'd use cement like a masculine and then come back and bone graft later? Yeah, or not. I, I have a few that just from the nature of patients uh, in our hospital and haven't come back and they finally came back like two years later and there's no issue. So. I haven't bone grafted all of them, but yeah. Beautiful. So um, let's say West Coast, Central Coast. I, I did medial and lateral plating. So um, so I did parallel plating in this instance. And you can see I've got uh, lateral compression. And then I'm trying to get this medial epicondyle keyed in and get a little supracondylar compression. And I felt really good about myself. I got medial and lateral fixation on it. And then he comes back at one year. And these are his uh, x-rays. And I'm concerned about that medial defect um, in the medial aspect of the humerus there. Any thoughts, uh, any thoughts about, um, and obviously I did an uh, electron osteotomy and that's one of the questions. I think I'm much better at getting really good distal fixation with an osteotomy. I think people who are more trauma trained feel more confident about using x-rays to get really good distal fixation but getting this fixation in the spool for me uh, with an osteotomy is a little bit easier. So, um, so that was my indication. So thoughts here, Doug, this is a, a case. He's pretty much asymptomatic, but comes back at a year and has this persistent non-union of the medial side, but union of the lateral side. I'm asking this as much of an, as an opinion uh, as anything else. Do you think this is something that we can leave? Is it something that we have to go after? The screws look quiet and stable distal. Any thoughts about that? I probably would have left alone. I would, I, are, are you gonna take, do you plan on taking his implants out? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, I, I wouldn't, he's not bothered by the implants. Let's put it that way. He's not bothered by the implants distally. Yeah, which is great. I mean, because this is the one where the ulnar nerve is just getting really irritated, but you've got, a, a, you've got an intact lateral column. I mean, it's got great osteosynthesis. So I think I would leave it alone. Thank God you said that. So I'm happy about that. I left this alone. And I think the, the thought process here is if you've got partial union um, and then rigid plate fixation over there that I think it's reasonable to consider non-surgical management. So I don't think every non-union or partial union requires surgical management. So I thought that was kind of an interesting idea and concept, but I was a little bit nervous about watching this as this was slowly developing, I thought about earlier bone grafting, but I think with these constructs distally, modern constructs, we can really get good fixation down there and we don't need to do anything further about it. I'd ask Jonah, what did you think, Jonah? Yeah, I mean, that's the case where if there was cement there already, you would be, it wouldn't even hurt because it wouldn't, it adds that layer of sort of not, you know, lack of motion. If that's a bigger defect, I would have gone and bone grafted it. I've done it in uh, like gunshot patients where they do have like a, you know, an L basically instead of a Y. And uh, it's a relatively straightforward procedure. You just go in bone graft and, um, and it heals pretty, pretty quickly. So if, if it was a bigger defect than that, like one centimeter, one and a half centimeter, I would have just gone and bone grafted it. But the, and, the construct and, is great. 
And what's your time period for that, Jonah, where you're worried about either plate or screw fixation, you know, uh, revising fixation and adding bone graft versus just only bone grafting? Is it three to six month kind of time yeah, period? or three, three to six month window, just bone graft. More than that, then I would probably either revise the screws. Like, you know, you have more, more screw options. So I probably would have added a screw distally or proximally switched one out just because they get tired after a while. Right. So I thought that was an interesting case of, um, of a non-union that doesn't necessarily require us um, to do anything surgical at that point. Yeah, question? Hey, John. You know, when I, when I look at that radiograph and you look, in, um, you look at the lateral column, you see the trabecular uh, alignment is pretty close to anatomic, which means those are mature trabeculae, right? And I just wonder, when you have such mature trabeculae and you look at the bone overgrowing the lateral plate, this is as strong as anything in the world. So I don't know that you'd gain much by interfering with it. So I agree with Dr. Hanel. I would just leave it alone. I love that. That reinforces my uh, thought process. And uh, like we talked about, maybe early bone, we could have intervened early, but at this point, I think everything looks so stable and strong that uh, I'll get away with watching that for a little while. I'll update you guys if this slowly fails over time, but I think it certainly looks strong and stable at this point. And John, I've got another, oh yeah, go ahead. Was the patient having any particular symptoms that might concern you? No, it was mostly me just uh, scrutinizing and worrying about his x-ray repetitively. And I think that was brought to me by um, my two partners from Harborview who talked about the importance of getting the x-rays perfect, anatomic reduction and union. So um, it was instilled in me uh, by them. So he was doing well, though. This is a very dark story. So I, I think this one's kind of interesting. Uh, this is a 25 year old uh, woman who comes to see me. She had a, a supracondylar or malunion from uh, when she was uh, young and that had healed and she was having ongoing elbow pain. So this is where the story, story turns dark. This was done at another institution. She underwent an ulnar nerve transposition uh, about four years ago that uh, did not help her symptoms. She underwent a tennis elbow debridement that, as it turns out, did not help her symptoms. Then it was decided that her symptoms, and these are actually her x-rays, were related to her radial head and radial capitellar arthritis, and she underwent a radial head arthroplasty, and then that came loose, and she had a revision radial head arthroplasty and a humeral osteotomy, and that was failing, so she underwent iliac crest bone grafting to her distal humerus. So all of these operations, she's 25 um, in the last approximately four years. And here's the x-rays that she comes in with. So Kevin, maybe we'll ask you, what are your thoughts about what would your, she's on narcotic pain medications by this point. She's basically been a perpetual patient for about the last four years. And she's had um, what would be, in my opinion, about five unnecessary surgeries here. Um, what are your thoughts about approach to this? Well, now, now you took a, a problem that was relatively simple, a, a, you know, a geometric problem or an anatomic problem and added all these complex variables. Uh, and just with the number of surgeries she had, I'd be super concerned about deep infection. Uh, the bone is a little bit uh, ratty looking, uh, and this may require, you know, a complex staged reconstruction. Uh, so certainly you need to do a, a very good workup for infection with aspiration, uh, you know, all the appropriate uh, inflammatory lab studies, uh, maybe even a bone scan or an indium scan to, to look at that. I imagine the bone scan is going to be hot for sure. Um, and then, you know, she's got a reason to be on pain meds. And I, I think it's easy to say someone who's on pain meds, you're going to discount them and, uh, and, and, you know, maybe not even offer them surgery. But, you know, she's she's got a reason to be on pain meds. And, and this, you know, while you may not solve that problem, you might, by, by taking care of this appropriately, you might give her her life back. Uh, and so, you know, this is not someone that you're necessarily going to take to the operating room the first time you meet them. Uh, you guys are going to get to know each other very well. Uh, and so I think you want to make sure that, you know, you know, after a couple of visits, after all your testing, that you've had a lot of opportunity to spend with this patient, her family members, other members that are going to help her make decisions in the office before 
uh, taking this patient to the operating room. But, you know, when you go, it's, it's going to be cultures, uh, bone biopsy, and it may be staged procedure, masculate technique, give her some stability, uh, and then uh, secondary procedures for uh, bone grafting. Yeah, that's great. So we did, um, we got inflammatory markers. For me, I think it's, that's more for my infectious disease colleagues, because I think in shoulder and elbow, it sure seems like we're pretty unreliable at detecting it, but it's worthwhile to uh, to do it. And we got an aspiration of the elbow joint. They didn't see a lot of fluid on ultrasound around the non-union site, but this is showing her uh, non-union site there. So would you, uh, Kevin, it sounds like you would plan for a two-stage or if, so her aspiration shows a uh, low cell count, 350 cells and 40% uh, neutrophils. Would you plan for a two-stage or would you be willing to go forward with a one-stage? What are your thoughts there? I think I would still probably plan on a two-stage procedure. She's had too many surgeries uh, and you'd hate to go through the process of, you know, taking her crest and putting it in there and then finding out down the road that, you know, she had a, a burning infection. So I think I would likely plan on a, you know, masculate technique, try to get that uh, elbow out of uh, the amount of varus that it's in, put a big cement block, stable fixation, by columnar fixation, and then uh, get the soft tissues healed, treat the infection, and then go back. That's great. And parallel plating or 90-90 um, plating? Am I going to be the lone man up here with parallel plates? Well, I, I think there's nothing wrong with parallel plating, and particularly in that last case that you presented with that bone loss uh, on, along one of the columns, you know, that's, that's an appropriate indication. Um, I, I do like that big uh, poster lateral plate. I think it's bulky. You, you can use some pretty hefty screws proximally and distally in it, uh, but I, I think I would supplement it with, you know, maybe a medial plate as well. Uh, my concern, you know, with the lateral plates is particularly in, in, in thin patients is it's so prominent uh, distally and the patients really don't like it. And, and that's the one more often that requires a secondary surgery to remove it. Whereas that, you know, poster lateral extra articular plate uh, can be very well tolerated unless they're super thin. Yeah, that's great. So um, speaking to those thoughts, I, I was uh, convinced enough about the lack of infection that uh, with my aspiration that I went forward with a, a basically a one stage approach, took everything down, uh, worked on the osteotomy to get alignment better. Um, and for me, this is going to those principles. We've got a salvageable bone stock. We've got a correctable problem in terms of his the poor surgical treatment from before. And obviously in their 20s, we're worried about the uh, possibility of um, a total elbow arthroplasty, certainly. So this is what I did. Again, uh, parallel plating with supracondylar compression. And I sort of made that round uh, osteotomy a little bit more of a trapezoid uh, in appropriate alignment. And to your point, she's um, just about, uh, she's just over a year out now. She almost immediately was off narcotics and basically back to normal. So she was just um, in a really bad spot and her subjective elbow value is about 85% now. So I think these patients can really be salvaged with good surgical technique, supracondylar compression, um, and uh, sort of an interesting way that she got there from a fairly straightforward problem at the very beginning as, as described. Here's another interesting case. Joan, I want you back in the mix on this. So this is a smashed distal, uh, distal humerus fracture, and you can see it's mostly capitellar. It is a B-type fracture, so this medial column is intact. My CT scan isn't great, but the trochlea is, uh, or the lateral aspect of the trochlea is broken off, and the capitellum and flipped up, and the lateral column is fractured. This is a very uh, low-resolution CT scan. Thoughts about how you address these almost artic osteoarticular fragments distally? Yeah, it's a really hard fracture. Um, <clears throat> typically, I kind of do an around-the-world lateral approach, which is like from the back, but then you use the um, lateral epicondyle as a sleeve because there's a fracture there. And then I go in line with that. And then I sleeve it out of the way so that I can look in the front and the back of the capitellum at the same time. And then the, the elbow is already sort of partially dislocated. So you just sublux it medially so you can see medially. And then it's a lot of painstaking puzzle making, uh, small K wires, mini fragment screws, uh, and then a lot of screws going into the intact medial segment from lateral to medial independent, and then also through a most likely a to make you happy lateral base plate. Ooh, I like the sounds of that. 
And um, so I thought I could get um, cued on this and just do a lateral based incision. Did you, would you do a posterior based incision and then a lateral exposure deep? Yeah, when, when it's purely an anterior capitellum, I will do an, a lateral approach only. But if it goes in the back posteriorly and there's a lot of like smash, then I, I typically will make a posterior approach uh, and then just sweep it around the front rather than the opposite. Yeah, so I thought I could get cute here and just make a direct lateral approach because it was a, the medial column was intact and uh, I applied, I fixed this with uh, some 2-4 screws and a lateral base plate because I thought I got, got acceptable fixation. These are my intraoperative x-rays, my two-week x-rays. Thankfully, it's flexed enough that it covers up any issues that I might have had on the AP view. But then we start to see trouble develop here, Doug. This is six weeks post-operative now. Um, and you can see that the joint starting to subluxate laterally. We've got a little subsidence of the fracture fragments. What are your thoughts or approach to this? 55 year old woman, her, uh, obviously her bone is not very good to have this fracture type. What, where would you go with this? Well, this is tough. I mean, and so the, where I go with this is I just go down the hall and say, Jonah, what am I going to do now? <laughs> And he'd scratch his head and I'd scratch my head and then we'd ask Daphne and Dave Bray. So the the answer to this is I I think you have failure of fixation and you could you could actually consider going to removing all this hardware and using an L, uh, osteochondral allograft or uh, just leave it and removing everything and shifting it over so that you have a congruous uh, ulnar humeral joint or as, as much as you can. But, you know, I, I don't have a, a, a real good answer to this. There's one aside that, that I, I add to these is I actually use a, an anti-glide plate on the anterior surface right at the, the if you go back two slides, one more, actually right there. If you see right where your arrow is, is I have found that placing like a, a two four or two old plate and holding all of that as part of my construct. I, I think that's, that's great. And even if it impinges on the terminal 15, 20 degrees of flexion, I think that holds it in place, but you know, getting that to get stabilized—that's a—that's a tough way to go. Uh, I think that's a—that's a great idea, and may have avoided this complication, which I think is mostly shortening of that fragment or getting some fixation into the the, the medial side. Obviously, would have helped me, yeah. and I think I was a little bit limited by that lateral approach. And then you put the epicondyle on, and then it's a little bit hard to figure out where that screw is going. So just inadequate fixation. I wrung my hands though. She didn't want anything done. So now she comes back at three months and she's got at least partial union of that uh, fracture fragment. So this is one where I was in a similar position, but I thought that I could correct this surgical problem. And I thought there was a salvageable block. So I actually planned for an intraarticular um, osteotomy uh, mm -hmm. of that, which was basically healed. So I did a uh, olecranon osteotomy, and you can see that step off that's in the joint, which is fairly substantial that, um, after that subsidence. So I made an intraarticular osteotomy that allowed me to distalize here. Um, so I could slide a little bit down the slope proximally, and it would distalize and anteriorize the fragment uh, distally. And I applied a clamp, um, and I could see that anterior reduction in particular was substantially better, which I um which was really my goal and i did two plates on the posterior aspect of the um of the bone here uh lateral and posterior and you can see that reduction sorry for the blood i know um i've got hand surgeons on who are probably a little better technically and um would have slowed that down and and um this patient really went on to heal this nicely and uh it's a save but i think that speaks to the fact that i think um according to the principles my fixation was limited and that could have been improved. And uh, certainly this worked a lot better. That's an excellent result.
Yeah, so um, I thought uh, our, uh, it was nice from that principle-based uh, standpoint. So I've got one more, Kevin. I don't know how much longer I can go, but uh, I've got one more case here. This one's kind of interesting. And this is a open distal humerus fracture that looks uh, fairly straightforward, but it's pretty common in a, in a mid-70s um, patient, early 70s patient. So she underwent open reduction internal fixation by one of my uh, partners um, and was healing well at about six weeks, comes back at six months and is healing and doing well. She liked that broken drill bit in there. And she said that everything was fine. So she was discharged uh, for follow-up and came back four years later uh, or at four years post-operatively with this um, fractured plates and obviously profound proximal humeral bone loss. Here's her CT scan, Jonas. This is a salvageable joint for you. She's 70, uh, 72, 71. She's obviously dealt with this for a little while, so you can imagine her functional uh, demand isn't too high. We did an aspiration. She had a previous open fracture, and there was no evidence of infection. Is this one that you would try and salvage, or would you bail to a total elbow or arthroplasty, or is it just up to the patient here? Uh, I would bail to an arthroplasty. <laughs> And thoughts about arthroplasty <laughs> constructs, because even doing a total elbow arthroplasty here is not exactly straightforward. Uh, yeah, I think you can use the, you know, the bone in the, you know, the center, uh, cut through that, go up there and just kind of shorten her a little bit. She's probably stiff by now. I use the overall alignment to give me rotation and then just cement it in place. That's great. So um, I was concerned about my ability to get really good fixation up there. So we actually did an allograft prosthetic composite for this, which has become more and more uh, popular at our institution. So you can cement that allograft uh, in and then um, compress on the back. And she's about three years out now. Her um, indications for me, she had a non-salvageable block. She, had, um, uh, she didn't have any specific contraindications to um, total elbow arthroplasty. And certainly she wanted a quote unquote one and done operation. So you can see union at that um, allograft uh, native bone junction. So for me, distal humerus fractures have an elevated risk of complications. A careful and thoughtful workup to distal humerus non-unions and, and malunions can help guide management. But decision-making in these revision, open reduction, internal fixation and total elbow arthroplasty cases can be very nuanced. Thanks Kevin again for letting me be on the uh, panel. Of course, that was, those were great, great cases. And uh, you know, now you've demonstrated you're an expert. So imagine you'll get all sorts of referrals from this group. <laughs> okay, uh, in the sake of time, we're going to um, move on to the last session. Uh, I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, thank you for uh, sticking with us. Uh, I'm going to finish up here talking about the unhappy ulnar nerve, uh, you know, associated with elbow trauma uh, and after elbow fracture fixation. So you know, ulnar neuropathy after distal humerus fractures is very common, reported up to 50% incidence. Uh, there are some conflicting reports as to the superiority of uh, routine anterior transposition versus simple in situ nerve decompression. Uh, we know that the incidence of ulnar neuropathy following distal humerus fracture is fairly similar, whether or not you are using a medial column plate with or without lateral column plating. Uh, we know that there is an increasing incidence of ulnar neuropathy on those individuals undergoing multiple elbow surgeries, such as in, you know, infected staged procedures or uh, with those requiring secondary procedures for post-traumatic reconstruction. Uh, and the ulnar nerve symptoms may be the result of the initial trauma, uh, post-operative immobilization, traumatic handling of the nerve during surgery, and uh, swelling and or scarring within the cubital tunnel. And the real answer is probably all of the above. Uh, so again, you know, the, the report, the incidence ranges anywhere from zero to 51%, but it's probably somewhere around 20% in the more modern literature. This was likely underreported in a lot of the older literature. And many of these will resolve with time if you watch these patients carefully. But late ulnar neuropathy is, is reported as high as 40%. And a lot of these patients did not have early uh, or even preoperative or early postoperative ulnar nerve symptoms. So this is something that can develop in a delayed fashion. Uh, and so careful monitoring of these patients as they're progressing in their rehabilitation is very important. 
uh, patients with documented preoperative ulnar nerve symptoms at the time of initial fracture fixation are much more likely to have persistent postoperative symptoms, and those patients may need to have their ulnar nerve managed differently at the index procedure. So in general, there are two schools of thought or two uh, theories on how to handle the ulnar nerve the in situ decompression or uh, the subperiosteal elevation has the benefits that it's much uh, simple, uh, much more simple surgically. There's less nerve handling. It avoids the potential for iatrogenic devascularization or traction injuries to the nerve during the procedure. But the cons for this part uh, or this option are that they leave the ulnar nerve in close proximity to the fracture and or the fracture implants along the medial column. And it also leaves the nerve tensioned behind the medial epicondyle and what may be altered anatomy after the fracture. And we'll discuss uh, in a few slides uh, the problems with uh, tension and strain on the ulnar nerve. Whereas with uh, those that uh, are supportive of anterior transposition routinely, they discuss and that the benefits are that this removes the nerve from contact with the implants, with the fracture, with potential callus. Uh, periarticular fibrosis uh, and postoperative edema that may increase the tension and strain on the nerve postoperatively. But the cons of this are that this is increased nerve handling, increased surgical complexity, and increased surgical time. Uh, it does increase also the potential of iatrogenic devascularization and traction injuries, uh, and also may increase the potential of late ulnar neuropathy from inadequate decompression and transpositions. And a lot of this may be simply surgeon comfort uh, and expertise. So there is no consensus. There are a number of studies that are in support of either the transposition or the in situ decompression without any significant differences uh, in incidence of postoperative symptoms, but most of these are retrospective case reviews. Uh, and the decision to move the nerve may be influenced certainly by the presence of preoperative ulnar nerve symptoms, the relationship of the nerve to the implants or if there's a low medial column fracture, the degree of tension on the nerve after fixation, and probably most importantly, again, the surgeon comfort and experience with nerve handling and transposition. Uh, I just, you know, I'd be willing to suggest or, or uh, suppose that uh, Dr. Davies and Dr. Uh, Barlow may be more inclined to leave the nerve there, whereas Dr. Hanel and I as, as uh, you know, hand surgeons, peripheral nerve surgeons may be more inclined to move the nerve, but I could be wrong. There is a randomized controlled study out of uh, Canada looking at patients undergoing distal humerus fractures, uh, whether and they were randomized to either in situ uh, decompression or anterior transposition. Uh, these patients all underwent EMG testing at six weeks postoperatively, and what they really found here is no difference. Now, it should be known that the ones that were randomized to in situ decompression at some point may have had their nerve transposed or decompressed out of the cubital tunnel and then placed back into the cubital tunnel at the end of the procedure. But there were no difference in outcomes between a variety of different elbow scoring systems, uh, DASH score and two point discrimination. Now, all of the patients uh, had EMG testing and 62% had ultimate EMG abnormalities at six weeks, but there were no differences between the in situ or the transposition group. 24% uh, of the patients had subjective ulnar nerve symptoms initially after surgery. Again, no statistical difference between the groups, and less than 8% had symptoms at one year, and again, no difference between the two groups. So we mentioned the importance of nerve gliding, nerve excursion, uh, and the nerve needs to be able to glide to tolerate what is normal shoulder and elbow range of motion. Uh, the ulnar nerve uh, should demonstrate about five millimeters of distal excursion with elbow flexion and three millimeters of proximal excursion with shoulder abduction, and then even more distal excursion with combined shoulder, elbow, forearm, and wrist range of motion, uh, and more, combi more combined uh, proximal excursion with uh, different shoulder, elbow, forearm movement. Uh, so a total of 16 millimeters of ulnar nerve excursion at the elbow is needed for normal upper extremity motion. Uh, and any postoperative nerve adhesions within the cubital tunnel may contribute to the loss of elbow range of motion after elbow fracture fixation surgery. Nerve strain is also important. Uh, the strain on the ulnar nerve at the elbow can be or will be increased by shoulder abduction of greater than 130 degrees, elbow flexion, wrist extension and radial deviation, and forearm pronation. And these are the same positions that require the most amount of nerve excursion. The impact of strain is very important. This was a great study that I found uh, while preparing this talk. 
uh, and this is rat uh, sciatic nerve study, but I think it can be applicable to all of our peripheral nerves. An 8% increase in nerve strain results in a 50% reduction in blood flow to the nerve, whereas a 15% increase in nerve strain results in an 80% reduction to the, in blood flow to the nerve. Now, looking at EMG studies, a 6% in strain held for an hour results in a 70% decrease in conduction velocity across that segment. A 12% increase in strain for an hour results in a complete nerve block. Uh, so when the strain was removed in these uh, studies, the conduction velocity ultimately returned to normal after a recovery period. But this may very much explain why patients are hesitant to progress with elbow flexion after uh, distal humerus fractures because this is increasing the strain on the ulnar nerve when left in the cubital tunnel. So any process that limits nerve excursion will result in increased nerve strain, decreased nerve perfusion, and decreased nerve function. Uh, and again, nerve adhesions will prevent a patient from progressing in recovery of elbow range of motion following trauma. When looking at uh, the ulnar nerve uh, during secondary procedures, and, and all of this has been discussed by Dr. Davies, by Dr. Handel, and by Dr. Barlow, uh, that the ulnar nerve must always be assessed when secondary procedures are being considered. Uh, this is a study also out of Toronto uh, on outcomes of ulnar neurolysis during post-traumatic reconstruction, and these are contracture releases, treatment of non-union, malunion, and those converted to total elbow all had ulnar nerve neolysis, neurolysis and anterior transposition. Five of the 21 had had transposition as part of the index procedure, but all of these patients seem to do much better with ulnar nerve grading after their uh, secondary neurolysis and transposition with improvements in the Gable and Amadio scores from 3.2 to 6.5 after the secondary reconstructive procedure uh, and improvement in the McGowan nerve classification uh, you know, pre-op listed there and then post-op listed underneath there. So going from 10 stage three or grade three McGowans to zero uh, grade three McGowans after the secondary procedure. So recommendations are, and this has also been mentioned uh, by all of our other speakers, a careful preoperative ulnar nerve examination is important even at the time of the index procedure. Uh, careful nerve handling, nerve exposure, uh, during uh, the management of the, the fracture or with secondary procedures. Consider transposition if the uh, patient has preoperative ulnar nerve dysfunction at the time of the index fracture fixation. Consider transposition if the nerve is in contact with a, a medial column implant. And certainly if you identify that the nerve is under tension during range of motion after fixation is complete, or if the nerve subluxes from the cubital tunnel with elbow flexion after uh, fracture fixation. Uh, we, uh, as always mentioned, we want to obtain rigid fracture fixation so that we can initiate early range of motion for these patients uh, so that the nerve adhesions may be minimized, uh, and then careful monitoring of the ulnar nerve following surgery with awareness uh, that an ulnar nerve adhesion may be the reason the patient is not progressing with their elbow flexion postoperatively. Uh, so very quick to pick up some pace here. These are some references. Uh, these will all be available as, as this talk is uh, all recorded on the YouTube page. Okay, so that's the end of our talk. We still have 107 people here on. Um, are there questions from the audience that still need to be answered? Okay. Well, thank you uh, to my co-panelists, Dr. Hanel, Dr. Barlow, Dr. Davies. I think this was an outstanding presentation uh, and an outstanding conclusion to this series on Complications Live. Uh, thank you to all of the participants. You will receive uh, a survey in the next 24 hours. Uh, and once you've completed the survey, you will be provided a link on how to obtain your CME credits. Uh, again, all of this uh, will, is recorded and will be available on the AO North America YouTube channel. Um, anything to add, Dr. Mudgall, in, in your sign-off? No, that was fantastic. Thank you. Wonderfully done and a great uh, way to end the session, the series, and tenure. <laughs> All right. Good night. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Mm -hmm.